Every once in a while, I like to add a hunt to my calendar that is just flat out nothing but fun. None of this grunting, hard work, cold weather like elk hunting can be. None of this having to hike to the top of a 10,000 foot peak like mountain mule deer can be. I just want to have a fun hunt every once in a while. Anyone who watches our content, you know that when the question is asked, Randy, what's your favorite thing to eat? What's one of your favorite things to hunt? Oh Lord. I am unexplainably somehow addicted to pronghorn hunting. People ask me why or how can it be? I think it's because they're absolutely unique to North America. The places they live, it can be up in the juniper and grass, way down in the sage, almost down in complete desert. You never know where you're gonna find them. They're very adaptable. They can live in some of the harshest environments from super, super hot in Arizona to super, super cold in Montana and Wyoming. And they are unbelievable when it comes to eating. They are, man, they are just really, really good. The only downside with pronghorn, they're not the size of elk. Folks, we have two days to get to Wyoming, fill a pronghorn tag, and get back to Bozeman. Michael and I got up early this morning, loaded the Titan, and we are on the road to central Wyoming. We've got this afternoon, tomorrow, and then the next morning. So, we're going to see what you can do in central Wyoming when you only have two days to fill a pronghorn tag. If you come to Wyoming and it's just about filling your tag, you'll be done in 10 minutes. One thing that was changing the dynamics of this hunt is my wife's father is in his last days and she just got back from Nevada visiting her family. She said, why don't you just go down for a couple days at least? You, you love doing it. And when you get back, I'll go back to Nevada. And normally I'd come down and spend four or five days and just look and look and look examine them, get them in the spotter, and, and that's how I get a lot more enjoyment out of pronghorn hunting. It's not about filling a tag. It's about here enjoying the experience, watching them here in late September be as crazy, ruddy, kind of, I mean, if you watch pronghorn in the rut, just that in itself is entertaining. On this hunt, it's a tag that I drew, doesn't take a lot of points. It's a spot that a lot of people don't apply for because Wyoming has a little asterisk that says difficult access. Well, it is kind of difficult access, but if you have your OnX system, you can navigate it. You'll find some, some bucks. You, you just gotta understand that every buck you see isn't one that you can go after. And if you take that mindset, that there's gonna be some bucks you have to just walk away from. It's not that frustrating. Came down, we left Bozeman, uh, I don't know, sometime in the morning. Uh, wasn't in any big hurry. Got down here to the area and just started driving around looking and instantly you're seeing pronghorn it's just oh there's one oh there's one there's one i think it was about the third or fourth pronghorn that we looked at michael the camera guy says hey i hear it sounds like you got a flat tire back here look at this look what i ran over a railroad spike brand new tire oh god 
that's going to create a major problem. I've never seen that before. Fortunately, I always carry two spares. And I decided, you know what, rather than screw around, I'm going to change this tire. I'm going to head back into town and get this tire taken care of. And maybe I can get out here for a last little bit of, of scouting and looking around. And that's what I did. I, thanks to the guys at, at the tire shop, um, I'm very, very thankful for their help. We were back on the road in half an hour, probably. I told the guy there, I said, can you believe I ran over a railroad spike? He said, that's the fourth railroad spike today. As my dad would say, you aren't hunting unless you got stuck or you got a flat tire. So now we're officially, the hunt has officially started. We better go find Big Hank fast. Well, we're out here. The wind's blowing so hard, I had to hide in this little coolie and still put the truck at my back to just block the wind so everything doesn't shake and vibrate. Got a group of antelope out of here. Can't tell what they are, but with my new super spotter from Leupold, I'm gonna find out. One of the things with Wyoming is there's an oil and gas road on every ridge and in every basin. So if I said, oh, I'm gonna go that way, I'd go about, mm, I can see about three quarter of a mile, there'd be another road and another road and another road. So really what you do is you just take advantage of the fact that there are tons of roads here and you put yourself in positions, put the sun at your back and just glass till you find one that's worth looking at even more. And that's what I did that evening and just drove around and looked and looked and looked kind of doing an inventory as I call it. And I did see one buck way out in the shadows. Uh, it was just too late. We weren't gonna be able to make a stock on them. And in the evening sun was, was getting low and the shadows were so tight as far away as he was. I could make him out as a good buck, but not you know super good or just average. He was, he just looked pretty good. So marked it on my GPS and said, tomorrow I'm gonna come back and look for that buck. We got about a half hour of shooting line. I'm now gonna start easing my way out a different direction. See what we might find. Tomorrow is more of the same. And considering the 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 fact that we, we had the malfunction of a railroad spike uh, messing up our plans, I thought we, we got to look over quite a few bucks that first day. So when Michael and I got up that morning, I, in my mind, I was looking for the buck that we had left the night before. And so we drove out there, I'd marked it on my GPS, get there, and unfortunately, the angle of the sun, the way the road is, it's west of where he was and the sun's coming up in the east, so I just had a short window of time before the sun got up and really messed up my glassing. And I didn't locate him, but he could have been down in any one of those little cuts and draws, you just never know. There's multiple areas I like to hunt in this unit. The other area in the unit I wanted to hunt is probably, I don't know, 20 miles away. So I told Michael, let's just burn out of here. Let's go over to that other part of the unit. We're on our way out there, we look and there's a group of antelope out there to our right. And I stop, I look at my GPS, and I'm like, hmm, these others are in public. That one looks really good. Get out the spotter. Yeah, darn it. I could get a better view. He looks pretty good. But by noon, if you've ever hunted these flat, the uh, sage, almost desert type basins in Wyoming, the mirage is so bad that it, it's really hard to tell. You gotta get really close. And, so I told Michael, let's take this little two track out there. If he goes around that little knob, we'll park and we'll make a big loop and get up and around and above him. And he did exactly what the script said. In 
definitely the, the best <clears throat> length that we found. He goes out and comes in really nice. And I was hoping that he had long prongs that were just flared out because all I ever got was a side view and it didn't look that great from the side. But a lot of times if you look from the side, it looks thin. And then when they turn towards you, you see these big prongs. Not the case with him. I know some people watch me hunt antelope on these episodes and probably think that I'm here just milking it for all I can. And that's right, I am. There's just all kinds of things that you will learn by watching them more and more. And that's why I don't fill my tag right away. I, I feel like every time I go pronghorn hunting, I'm learning. I'm learning some little quirk they have or something else that they do or why they do this or why they do that. We jumped in the truck, drove down the highway, got way over to the other part of the unit and got right, I mean, just right away. Oh, there's some, there's some bucks, there's some bucks, there's some bucks. Yes, there are antelope everywhere. And there was one on a skyline that we thought was a pretty good buck. So we drove around, tried to get a better view of him and found out, well, he'd moved back out on the bench, drove back up on the bench and then he'd move down over and kind of off to our right a little bit southwest of us. And, and again, looked at him, mm, yep, not what I'm looking for. We're, as it's starting to get dark, I'd say we've got 40 minutes of shooting light left. We're driving out to this spot and this buck is out to my left. That guy. He has everything I'm looking for. And fortunately, this buck was with a herd of antelope. And I got to looking at his body size, and he's about the same size as the does. And then there are some older bucks in there that probably don't have as big horns as he does, but body size, they're significantly bigger. And that told me that this buck is a young buck. And I decided, you know what? As cool looking as he is, I'm not, I'm not gonna shoot him. He is going, he is one of those bucks that has everything with another one year, maybe, yeah, maybe one year, for sure in two years, is going to be a Boone and Crocker buck. And I'll be honest, the temptation to shoot a cool looking buck like that was, was really high. I think Michael looked at me and he could tell I was starting to get that twitch, like, ooh, ooh. And I, I'll admit, if that buck would have been alone, without other antelope to compare his body size to, I probably would have shot him because I wouldn't have had that relative comparison of how young he is. <laughs> After a day and a half of seeing nothing, the temptation to shoot that buck is so huge, but I just know what he can be and let him go. Someone's get, if someone shoots him next year or the year after, they're gonna shoot a whopper. So with that day pretty much over, I told Michael, I said, well, we got to be out of here by noon tomorrow. I guess we better get serious about this project. And tomorrow morning, we're going way back to the end. I would say of if I took the five nicest bucks I'd seen, three, probably two or three of them were way back in that far end. And there's a lot more private back there, so I knew that could be a challenge, but what the heck, we're gonna go back there. So we got up that morning, went to get some donuts and coffee, which for me, antelope hunting is not one of these intense activities. You need donuts, coffee, maybe a Dairy Queen, a few other things along the way. That, that's what antelope hunting's for. I mean, you don't make this into work. This is pure pleasure. And so we get out there right at daylight and still can't find that one buck from the, the first day. And again, in the morning, the sun is not in my favor. We're seeing some other bucks that are, I'll admit, they're, they're kind of tempting. You gotta leave in a couple hours. There's a buck out here with one doe that, I don't think he's huge. He's got decent mass, decent prong. I can't tell if he hooks in, hooks back. He's not that tall, but I love eating antelope, so. It's either that one, or that one, 
or one of the 20 we probably saw on the way in here. There's so many bucks, it's, at this point, it's just a matter of saying, okay, this one will do. There's some BLM and some private, and we see a really good buck. The best buck that we'd seen the whole trip is way back in this drainage. And on my GPS, I'm trying to judge whether he's on public or private. So I told Michael, let's hang a left and go up this draw, keep the ridge between us and him, and we'll peek over. And we start going down that draw, and the boundary is getting tighter and tighter and tighter. And pretty soon I hit what I know is the boundary, and I glass him and I, I range him. And he's 350 yards, I think, something like that over there on the private. Darn it. We need him to come left. We've got him right here at about 280 yards. But they're right on the property boundary. I need him to come left. So when we're sitting there and I'm bemoaning my bad luck that this buck happens to be on private, Michael, the camera guy, says, well, what about these ones over here? And I look, I'm like, wow, that's another pretty darn good buck. And there's, I don't know, few does with him and I'm looking at my own axe and I'm like darn it they're up on that ridge that ridge is private if they come down in the bottom it's public so I'm kind of turning around getting organized thinking well maybe enough bucks running back and forth here that that guy's pretty aggressive maybe he'll get pushed or his does will get pushed or he'll push another buck and it'll bring them down here onto the public Just about the public. Push her this way, pal. He takes off running, goes, makes this humongous loop way out into the private, up over the ridge, out of sight. I'm like, well, there goes that opportunity. And Michael's like, here he comes. And then Buck comes running back over the hill. And he comes over there with his does. Well, what had happened is over to our right, where we couldn't see, another buck was starting to get closer to his does. And he was going to go run him off. And so I range it. Oh, I can make this shot. Get set up on my bog pod. I see something fly way out past that buck and I'm like how in the heck could that be I had my dial set at 350 or 250 I shot right over him when I was getting ready to shoot up this direction it was 375 so I had my dial set at 350 <sighs> I screwed it up, okay? I have no reason, no excuses other than I screwed it up. Ah. And he is a pretty darn nice buck. He would have been one of the nicer bucks of the trip. I guess the good news is it means I get to hunt a little more. And on our way walking back to the truck, walking these ridge lines in a glass way out there, I told Michael, I said, you know what? That basin, there's a buck bedded with a couple of those out there. What do you say we sneak over there and let's see if we can get in archery range. Maybe I can shoot one. There's three antelope bedded right over this ridge. Good chance if there's a buck in there, he might get shot at. Trying to clear that rock right in front of me. And there's this rock, this little rock right in front of me. And no matter what that buck is doing, 
when I would get on my bog pod, that buck, my rifle barrel, even though the scope was just clear in the rock, I would look, I was gonna hit that rock in front of me. Ready? Yep. Turn more broadside, buddy. You got a broken prong on one side. range <laughs> I'm sure the audience is thinking Randy what are you waiting for I mean he's so close that he got even closer to the lip which made my angle even worse as far as clearing that rock Told you we had to get within archery range, folks. We had him right here at about 45 yards, but this rock right here, I'm at a different angle than the camera. All I can see is here, and I'm popping out, trying to get closer. It's not. <laughs> nice shot. Thanks, Michael. Like, the wind was coming from them to us, and they had no idea where we were. They just kept looking and looking, and. It's fun to come here and just look and look and look and look and I think Michael knew that this morning I was about ready to make a purchase. I was done window shopping and whatever unfortunate buck. <laughs> this buck wasn't even here when we snuck over. He came walking in from the left. The other buck is a, bit, a little bigger than this one, but oh well, doesn't matter. He's laying right there. You want to go see what yep. what the result is? I do. You're a nice buck. You broke one prong and almost another. You were a fighter. What a fighting dude. He broke off a bunch here, a bunch here. He broke off that prong. This one is all cracked. I could break it off if I wanted. But look at that mass. He is a heavy buck. Thank you, Mr. Buck. Thank you.
this. The pronghorn is not anything that the record book crowd's gonna get excited over, but he's gonna be a special buck in my mind. He's gonna be that buck that I came down. I found the window of time to do it. I played my hand for all it was worth. And in the end, I had a great hunt. And I have a lot of amazing, just fantastic meat that's gonna go in my freezer. And that pronghorn is gonna help feed me over the winter and every time I eat some of that, I'm gonna think about these wild open spaces, these amazing sage flats and rolling hills of Wyoming. And I'm gonna resolve that as quick as they'll give me a tag, I'll be back here to do it again.